All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for being here and uh, continuing to endure. Um, I know that this can get kind of deep, but hopefully it's beneficial. Hopefully it's been a good study for you. Um, last week, we definitely kind of got into some deeper things real, um, involving genetics. And just kind of as a recap, uh, we had talked about RNA development, DNA development, that code that, you know, dictates what we all look like, what we develop into, and not just us as humans, but li literally every living thing requires DNA. It requires a blueprint for its building, for its outer structure and characteristics, okay? And so, again, when we look at the explanations for how we get here, for, for explaining how we are today and our origins, we have these two options, Again, that God created us or that we developed from non-living things. And so it gets really hard to explain how we come from non-living things. And we had to get down in the weeds about how that might occur and then really how it's not actually the best explanation. And close, really, it's not even close to the best explanation because when we look at RNA, when we look at DNA, those two things developing on its own, very unlikely there's no good way to show how it's been done. But even if you grant that it has been done to replicate itself, to actually build, to do what it's doing right now in your, in your body and in my body with red cell uh, production, all of the things that it takes to maintain you and for all those new developing babies out there, all of that – it takes way more structures around the DNA to help it facilitate, to translate and transcribe, to actually help build more of it. All those things have to be there. And we talked about the DVD dilemma last week, which, again, that RNA is like the DVD. The, the DVD has a bunch of information encoded on it, but without the DVD player, it's pretty useless. And what if the DVD has the instructions for the DVD player on it? You're never going to know what's on the DVD. It's never going to help you build that DVD player, right? And that's what we talked about. That's where we kind of left last week is that even if you got RNA, you don't have the machine around it to help build more of it, to replicate, to build in this single cellular, single cellular organism, this bacteria or a protozoic uh, single cell organism up into especially multicellular organisms. You don't have the necessary molecular machines to help replicate that RNA in the DNA. Because if that information's there, that's fine. But the information that helps you build the things that help build it are on there. You can't build any more of it, right? It's, it's a kind of a paradox situation. Now, where we're starting, again, grant that, again, evolution is occurring. I want to bring us back out just a little bit on an objective front Say, okay, what is evolution again? You got to ask that question sometimes because as this question kind of leads us to think, well, what about observed evolution? You know, we've observed change over time. We observe animals changing over time. We need to get specific about what we mean by that, okay? Do we mean change as in, well, uh, cats, Sometimes have brown fur, sometimes has white fur, sometimes it's calico, sometimes fill in the blank. Or for us, sometimes we'll have blue eyes or we'll have brown eyes. There are outward characteristics that will change over time. We age, we do change over time, but is that what we mean by observed evolution? Right? That's the thing that we need to really kind of discuss because that's what you're going to meet probably up front is these examples of evolution – that will be thrown to you. Now, probably one of the most uh, well-known examples would be Darwin's work on the Galapagos Islands, right? Uh, where he discovered what animal that he really, like a, a lot of his work is based upon. This is brownie points if anybody. Yes, yes, exactly. The finches. So his work with the finches is actually carried on to till today. Oh, no. Is this not going to work? Yeah. Batteries might be dead in this. 
there any batteries down here? If they're not, you might have to. I'll just say next slide. Next slide. Or not. That's okay. I've got the slides right here. You just won't get to see the pretty pictures. That's not it. <laughs> They're working hard up there, I know. That is that is not on them. Just unfortunate. Hey, there we go. Okay. So, finches. Uh, they're a type of bird. And what Darwin started observing, and a lot of what his book, uh, The Origins of Species, I actually have read that book when I actually was... Um, I was actually assigned to read the book at Freed Hardeman in a class that I did. Interestingly enough, you're kind of like, what kind of curriculum's going on over there at, at Freed? Uh, this, this whole entire class was actually about the origin of species. This was a study on evolution. Um, and, and again, I think I've referenced it before, but it was trying to give us an objective look at this side of science to help us decide you know, not only as scientists, but also as Christians, what makes more sense. And this is really where a lot of my Christianity was solidified and my own faith was solidified going through this class. It was a lot like what we're doing here, just a lot less PowerPoint and us reading that book. So be thankful you're not having to read that book. But a lot of what his book is about is really about natural selection, something that we've already talked about before. And again, that I think very well-established natural selection is alive and well. It does actually occur, but that doesn't undermine anything uh, that us Christians believe. That doesn't undermine anything, you know, about our faith or about um, what is mentioned in Genesis. In fact, it only helps, at least for me, bolster the idea that there is a design to all of us because, again, natural selection, what it does is it helps the fittest to survive. And that word fit changes. It doesn't mean always the fastest, strongest, smartest. It means whatever fits that environment best at the time. Okay? And so what it does is that it actually allows those that are more fit for an environment to reproduce. So their genes get passed on, while others that are not fit for the environment, they don't get the chance to reproduce. Their offspring is... Uh, never introduced into the world, so their genes don't get passed on. That is, in a nutshell, what natural selection is. That is an adaptive mechanism that God has placed within us, not only as humans, but with everything that's living in this world. We don't live in a static system. Our, our planet is literally rotating right now. It's not only rotating... Uh, and spinning on an axis, it's actually revolving around the sun. We are literally in motion right now. Our weather patterns change. Our environments thus will change. We need to be able to adapt and change to changing environmental conditions. We have an intellect that no other animal has. Maybe more so some than others. I'm kidding. Nobody in here. Um, but... But seriously, a lot of other animals that have environmental changes, they need to be able to better survive their environment. So what did God do? He gave them the ability to adapt. If you didn't have that ability to flex and bend with your environment, if you're in a dynamic system like we're in, you need to be dynamic also. Again, it just screams design from my perspective. Not necessarily it being the... the driving force of all the diversity that we see. So going back to the finches, what Darwin observed was that on the Galapagos Islands, you had all these little birds named finches, and he assigned different species of finches based on their beak size. So what, what happened was is that certain finches on certain parts of the island had certain food resources. Now, these bigger ones, uh, that one with the little seven above it, I don't know if you can see the, well, it's not a seven. See, from here it looks like a seven. It's actually one with a little hood on top. That number one, yeah, with the mouse, I don't know if you can see it. Thanks, Michael. Um, that one with the biggest beak, we'll just go with that. That one actually was more of a ground-dwelling 
uh, finch that use their beak to actually open up nuts and crack open nuts and seeds that are very hard and impossible for these smaller finches with smaller beaks to do. So when the food source on one side of the island was heavier in seeds and things like that, those birds survived and reproduced more. Whereas if you needed smaller beaks to reach into, say, like pine cones and pull out smaller seeds where those big beaks get in your way, they reproduce more on one other side of the island, depending on the food source. So natural selection was going on, and there was a lot of research done by Darwin. That's fairly true. Now, if I go to the website of, say, uh, the Darwin's Finches and the Galapagos Islands, um, their website, galapagosconservation.org, um, if you read through, there's a lot of good information on the Galapagos Islands and whatnot. Now, I just want to read a very small section of this. Right there in the second paragraph, it says the original uh, grass quits arrived on the Galapagos, and those grass quits are uh, birds like the finches. They diversified and adapted to different environments found on the island, eventually becoming different species. They famously evolved to have different beaks, which are suited to different food types, such as large seeds and invertebrates, allowing them to occupy different niches. Everything good so far. Then if you scroll on down... It says that this first evolution or this evolution occurred over about a million years. Now, that's where you lose me. That's where you lose me. If in real time we can see these beaks, beak uh, sizes change depending on what birds are better surviving certain portions of the island and having different food sources – why do we need to interject a million years to see some change here? Again, it starts becoming what is your view? What is your paradigm? What is your frame of reference when you're looking at these things? And so I'm going to try this one more time. Maybe, oh, yeah, it does work. Maybe I was just using it wrong. It's on me, guys. So how do we get different beak sizes? How do we get this diversification? How do we get this flexibility? I mentioned a name of um, uh, last week, mentioned something called an allele when we were talking about DNA. Now, all an allele is, is a variant form of a gene. And again, if your genes dictate what you look like, then an allele is a possibility of what you could have looked like. It's a variant of what you could have been. Now, you get these from your parents. So up here, these little blue lines that you're seeing, those are chromosomes, one from your mom, one from your dad. Now, the allele there labeled B, capital B or lowercase b, those uh, – yeah, you still can't see the laser on this. When will I learn? Um, once those actually get together, you can have a homozygous uh, allele. Uh, which will be dominant in whatever trait that's portraying, you will absolutely uh, portray it outwardly. Now, heterozygous, which is you've got a dominant and a recessive allele. You get your uppercase B and your lowercase B. You know, the more dominant gene will take over and be expressed. Uh, and then flipped around, you're still having both. But then you might have the recessive, the BB, the lowercase B, and express something uh, outwardly, phenotypically, outwardly characteristic that maybe isn't seen very often at all because it is a re recessive gene, but the right parents get together and those alleles are now expressed. How does that happen? Well, maybe the right conditions environmentally got them together and they were the fittest for that environment and they expressed this new gene. I know that's a lot. I get that. But... That's how natural selection occurs, and that's how we can see so much diversification depending on who gets together and who makes babies. It's pretty cool when you think about it. At least it is to me. I don't know. You might be thinking, let's, let's move on. Uh, but this is really important. This is one of the driving factors of the change that we see. This does get called evolution. 
there is change over time occurring. Again, we have to go back to what we mean by evolution. Sure, I believe change over time. Things do change over time. But I don't believe, because we haven't seen it, a change from one type to another type. All those finches that we were looking at right here, yeah, they all look a little different. Guess what? They're still finches. They're still birds. So different species, and see, that's another thing too, and I alluded to this earlier, but to get to your question, taxonomy, uh, taxonomy I don't know if y'all have dealt with it much, but it's the naming system of living organisms. It's really to help categorize all these different living organisms and how they're related to each other. So naming them different species, say that, that one with a really large beak, number one up there, it's a little different than the one with a very small beak. So its species is, you know, the genus would be the same, but its species, its last name would be something probably alluding to the fact that it's got a big beak. I don't know what the genus and species name of that bird is. It's probably good for me to know. But all of these are in Latin, okay? And I, I actually took a bunch of different uh, studies, uh, biological studies, environmental biological studies at Freed, one of those being uh, herpetology, where I studied frogs, lizards, snakes, amphibians, and reptiles. One of them, and I can just remember off the top of my head, uh, was the hognose snake. Anybody heard of the hognose snake? It's kind of a rare snake. It'll play dead on you. It's kind of funny. But its genus and species name is Heterodon platyrhinos. So Heterodon, both of these names will tell you something about that snake. Okay? The genus name, Heterodon, means different tooth. What's interesting is that the um, eastern hognose snake is actually a venomous snake, but it's not considered one because it has a rear fang position. You'd have to stick your finger down its throat to be bit by it. So knowing that heterodon means different tooth actually gives you an idea. Something's going on with this snake. And then platy rhinos, rhino, y'all have heard of that, you know, rhinoceros. So rhino dealing with nose, um, platy rhinos means different nose, flat nose. If you see this snake, it has a hog nose. It has a very flat nose. So it helps give you, it helps determine or helps you determine what characteristics you're looking for if, you know, you see this name. So when you have this species name, it's helping you define characteristics that you can see about it that, yes, that top bird looks a little different than this bird, but they can still mate. They're still finches. There are just some different outward characteristics like a lot of us. Now, we're not going to be all different species. You know, you're not going to have your own species name. You're not going to have your own species name. That's not necessarily what happens. But, yes, this is a man-made um, naming system to help to, you know, keep all the diversity in check. Okay. And I, I don't know if that answers your question. I went off a tangent there, but good enough. Okay. <laughs> Just don't say any more of those weird Latin names. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you would, You'd also get people with, that would find um, bones and, and things like skulls that say, yeah, we have different species of human like the Neanderthal or things like that, um, which interestingly enough, some of the characteristics of us, if we live long enough, they actually get a little more exaggerated, uh, not to mention if somebody was burned with a birth, a birth defect. Um, things could happen there as well, but they're still humanoid, uh, still considered human, but different species of human. So, uh, but yeah, we would all be still the same species here, even though we're going to look just a little different. Interesting, I know, uh, that we're not split up in different little subspecies, but, uh, but these are. So, I just want to reiterate again that species, all it's doing is just naming. It's a naming system that men and women have come up with to help identify certain animals by their characteristics and these names change that's the other thing that's a little frustrating with about it because when you hear species it sounds more concrete it sounds like oh this is fact well while i was in that herpetology class and i'm pretty sure i've already said this but i'll say it again because it's pertinent here um the american bullfrog the genus name see i actually had to know all these names and write them out on a final uh, he would 
post a picture, say, okay, what is this? And I'd have to write genus and species name. The American bullfrog was Raina for the longest time. That was what its genus name was. While I was in that class, it got changed to Lithobates, a much longer and harder name to spell. I did not appreciate that while I was in that class. Um, but I'm thinking, well, why did that change? Why did that name get changed? Why, why did Raina not suffice and Lithobates had to be included now? And see, and, and maybe that's, okay, I better understand what you're saying now. So these classifications, species can be very, very closely related together, okay? Or they can be completely different. There are different species. That gets kind of wonky because when you actually look at these birds, you're thinking, well, they're all the same thing, but they're actually different species. Now, that, that doesn't make sense. There's that whole taxonom ta uh, taxonomy hierarchy you actually get you get started with a kingdom all the way down, file a class order. You have all these different categories that help organize all these different animals. So you have animals that will be different species, but they're also in a, in a different class. They're in a different order. They're completely different. Species, when you get down to the species, you're getting very, very specific about that one particular type of animal. You can go all the way up this classification hierarchy all the way to the class and order and phyla, and it includes a whole bunch of different, I mean, all of these are included in the same genus, which means they're very closely related. It's not that they're, they're just birds. They're a specific type of birds that are very closely related together. So species, that species name, doesn't mean there's a lot of separation between them. But in movies, and when you see this, if you don't know all of that, when you think different species, you're thinking about something completely different, right? That's a good point. I I guess because when I thought about this, that was that's what I was taught in college, and uh, I failed to think about. I should have actually posted a, a schematic of taxonomy. I think that might have been a little more clear. Uh, but are we tracking now? Okay, awesome. Um, so getting back on, getting back to where I was on this. Um, that's a lot of good stuff. I should have actually had that up there. I apologize. Uh, but again, that that difference or the potential difference comes from alleles, okay? Comes from uh, this variant form of a gene in your DNA. It can. Now, here's the here's the crux of the matter. To get new information, to to express different uh, characteristics to get to something else, you've got to have mutation. You can't just have natural selection. Why? Well, we've bred dogs for hundreds of years, and we've got nothing but dogs. This is beyond natural selection. This is human selection. This is, I'm going to take this kind of dog, and I'm going to breed it with this kind of dog. We have just about exhausted every type of allele expression we can through dogs. We've got everything from a Great Pyrenees all the way down to a Chihuahua. Very different, but they're still a dog. Nothing new has been created. We're not leaving this to random chance. We're not leaving this to environmental condition. We are intentionally, as, an, as a being with intellect, imposing breeding on a certain animal, and we've yet to be able to create something different. What natural selection does is just help express what is there. That's why initially, after some uh, consideration, natural selection can't be the only thing that drives evolution. You have to have mutation of genes for new information to occur. But that really doesn't happen. Most of the mutations that we see are benign. Nothing changes. It actually doesn't do much to you. doesn't do much to any other organism. A lot of them, other than that, pretty detrimental. When you have a mutation in your genes, it's usually not a good thing. Uh, when I was talking to the intern, I said, look, most, most of these mutations, if not all of them, don't produce new information. She goes, oh, yes, yeah, uh-huh, it does. And I said, okay, 
can you give me an example? She goes, well, it's the trisomy of chromosomes. I said, yeah, well, that's only of the 23rd. And if you have a trisomy of the 23rd chromosome, you have three of them, that person is going to have Down syndrome. The trisomy of all other chromosomes, I believe, ends up killing you. You don't live. I may be wrong on that. I'll do some research on but I'm pretty sure. Not necessarily a, a strong argument. Okay, you've introduced new information that severely hinders your ability. If we're just looking at you as a physical specimen to produce more progeny, you don't have a soul. You're just here to reproduce. Not really being the fittest in any environment. And I'm and I'm in no way trying to down talk anybody with downs. That's not it. I, I love love a lot all those people. That's not it. But if we're talking about somebody being fit, that's not fit in the bill. Um, and I actually had somebody give me the example of someone. So like, well, there was a beneficial mutation um, for people in Africa uh, where they got sickle cell anemia. They can't get malaria now. Well, yeah, and the, they don't get much oxygen either. Shortens their life considerably. It shortens what they can do considerably. Is that really beneficial? No. On the off chance you end up getting malaria, maybe. But again, I, I give those few examples just to show maybe the fallacy of and the stretching of the idea, yes, this is how we got to where we are, but every example that we see right now doesn't point that way. Really, the what we see is that this information has been here. It's been implanted and has to have been here altogether for us to be the way that we are. I want to move on to this right here. The other thing about this, too, is that when you read Darwin's book, all of these steps and changes occur one at a time. These things are a build on top of another process. So I wanted to read this uh, to you. I've got a few quotes here. Um, so if more than one mutation is needed, the probability of getting all the right one uh, right, right ones grow exponentially worse than they already were. And this is Michael Behe. Uh, he's done a lot of incredible work uh, with DNA uh, and uh, looking at the creation uh, paradigm uh, through the pre uh, creation framework. Now, I want to read this, and I should have read this one first. I meant to. This is Charles Darwin saying this in his book. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. If any one organ existed where it was irreducibly complex, multiple things had to happen simultaneously, then everything that I'm saying here breaks down. Now, this came out of the Journal of the Proceedings of the U.S. National Academy of Science, says, quote, simultaneous emergence of all components of a system is implausible. So kind of supporting what Darwin's saying here can't happen. Now, already Michael Behe is saying that the mutations that would have to occur for all of these genes to produce everything that it needs to be self-sufficient is extremely unlikely. Here is an example, and this was – he actually was the one uh, that coined the, the term and the phrase irreducible complexity, meaning that you cannot get any less complex than this. It, this at its state right now, you cannot break it down anymore. So now the flagella, this is a little tail uh, like a rotor uh, and uh, off like an – onboard motor, basically, uh, that helps bacteria swim through fluid. That's what this is. Um, obviously, my slides were not formatted great. Looks great on my computer, but 
not up there. Um, but basically the flagella, this is a um, molecular machine. And I wanted to uh, mention this one because this was on Dr. Bay Hayes, uh, one of his major examples that he used. And he's done a lot of research on this. Now, the flagella acts, again, like an outboard motor to propel bacteria through fluid. There have been genetic knockout experiments with bacteria on this little tail, okay? And there takes about 35 genes to get this tail the way that it is. And they have come to find, scientists have come to find, and this is just an interesting tidbit, but that tail, that flagella or flagellum, multiple, um, is approximately 100% efficient. That's pretty cool. And for those of you who are uh, machinists or engineers, you don't get systems that are 100% efficient. Uh, and this one is right there at it. It's pretty cool. Uh, now, there have been genetic knockout experiments that have shown uh, that this flagellum or flagella fails to assemble or function properly if any one of its approximately 35 genes are missing meaning that it takes all 35 genes in the right order, doing what it needs to do for it to even exist. And this isn't a single cellular organism. This is in a bacteria. This is very small, very simple in comparison to you and me. Now, this is irreducibly complex. And it's one of thousands of molecular machines that are actually talked about in Michael Bay Hayes' uh, book. I think it's Darwin's Black Box. Um, now, I want to read you just a little bit. We've got, we've got time. I don't think we've got time to watch uh, our section of the video. Y'all okay with that? We we're going to just look at some animals. He's going to basically say what I'm saying already. Okay, I'm going to go on. Um, so... I wanted to read this to you very quickly. It's not very much. But this is actually out of Michael Behe's, um work here. Now, proteins. Now, proteins, again, get considered uh, as machines as well to help do different things within your body. Uh, it's not just the powder that Isaac drinks to get all swole. Um, proteins commonly interact with uh, molecules through a hand and glove fit, but these interactions often require multiple amino acids to be just right before they occur. In 2004, Bay Hay, along with the University of Pittsburgh physicist David Snoke, simulated the Darwinian evolution of such protein protein interactions. Their work calculations or their calculations found that for multicellular organisms, Evolving a simple protein-protein interaction, which required two or more mutations in order to function, would probably require more organisms and generations that would be available over the entire history of the Earth. They concluded that the mechanism of gene duplication and point mutation alone would be ineffective because few multicellular species reach the required population, population sizes, meaning that in order to have a chance for all these mutations to occur, you have to have a population size that hasn't existed statistically. Now, what's interesting is that four years later, during an attempt to refute Behe's arguments, Cornell biologist Rick Durrett uh, and Dina Schmidt ended up begrudgingly confirming that he was basically correct. After calculating the likelihood of two simultaneous, and this is just two, just two, okay? Uh, two simultaneous mutations arising via Darwinian evolution in a population of humans, they found that such an event would take greater than 100 million years, given that humans diverged from their second supposed ancestor with chimpanzees only 6 million years ago. They granted that such a mutational event are very unlikely to occur in a reasonable time scale. Now, these are Darwinian evolutionists admitting this, and that's just – and again, I want to point this out. Just two mutations happening together simultaneously, not more than two. It gets compounded even further if you have more than two necessary mutations to occur. I know we're, dang, we're below the weeds. We're in, we're in the dirt now. I get that. But I just want to bring this to your attention because, again, when we back all the way out – 
and we have discussions with people, there is actually good research. There is good data out there that does support not only our way of seeing things, but it, there's a lot of de there's a lot of data out there that straight up refute uh, what the conventional paradigm says, John. Yes. Uh, flagella. Yeah. Well, that's 35 genes to create that little tail. And if any one of those genes had not been there, it doesn't work. And so basically, if, if that were to be created, multiple, not maybe 35 mutations would have to occur all at once, but definitely more than two would have to occur for this information to occur for this little tail to even occur. And they're saying that if you mutate any one of these genes and you take them out, it, it doesn't work. There was a, I, I didn't include this, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it uh, in, in the book uh, that I'm referencing here, that there's a greater chance of a human being blind, closing their eyes, taking a bow and arrow, shooting it, into the sky and hitting a pre-selected atom out in the cosmos than this occurring. Yeah, it it's very remote. And, and if we're being honest, if they were being honest, it is just not statistically possible. Now, I will be honest with you here, though. Here's the, here's the thing. All they get to say is, well, we're here. So it had to have happened. No, no matter how great the... Uh, implausibility is if it's technically possible it happened so just be ready for that answer but if you're going to be intellectually honest it it all boils down to your faith in it yeah. it all boils down to having faith that this happened there is no scientific um way to know that it occurred and really it's in the face of science all that statistical uh, analysis that that's done you have to have faith that it did happen this way you raise your hand we're all going on the fact that on the assumption that this happened if you go back to the changes mm -hmm. to say that god didn't create the changes to start with in this manner the way they are you know they, he's saying that they evolved to these different types why wasn't they made that way originally? There was, I don't know how many species of dinosaurs on the earth. Mm -hmm. Do you think they all changed from one to the other? They were all on the earth coinciding at one time. God made different dinosaurs. Sure. They made different pinches. These pinches may have not evolved into this. They may have been created that way. Well, there, there have been observations of finches with big beaks actually getting smaller beaks through um, them breeding. So, I mean, it, it does actually occur. It's been observed, but that doesn't mean much. That does. If you marry someone, mm -hmm. your child gets your nose, her height, your ears. Hopefully she's tall. You know. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's simple. That's just part of our environment. That's not evolution. Right. And, and again, I think, and, and that's right. I mean, you're really getting at what, what I've been trying to establish at the beginning of this is that if we're using the word evolution, how it's meant in the books, that's not what it is. If we're meaning it's change over time, okay, that happens a lot. We change over time. And we can change, genetically speaking, depending on who our partners are and what our progeny look like and what they express genetically. Those are different things. We're, it's micro evolution versus macro evolution if we're going to really get down in the weeds on the terms. Macro evolution doesn't have good support. It just doesn't. Micro evolution through natural selection happens all the time. Again, I think it's the adaptability given to us by God. And the next thing I wanted to actually look at really demonstrates that. Uh, so these kinds, these groups of animals, show a couple of different things. So Felidae, uh, that is a group all on its own, talking about cats, feline. You, you've heard that word around cats. Felidae is, is a taxonomic grouping given to the class of uh, cats. And then 
uh, canines. Uh, you've got dogs all the way up through, and again, we've seen the breeding that's happening again with them. Uh, Ursidae, or you know, like if you heard um, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, the big bear, little bear. Uh, that's why you hear that. That's actually a, a Latin term given to the groups of bears. And then you get into the groups of horses at the back end. You can have a common ancestor that has the ability, that has the genetic information to pass on, to have different characteristics, but they still stay within their kind. That's a major difference here. It's not going from horse to cat or cat to horse. They stay within their kind. They may look different, and a lot of them end up do looking different, but that's that flexibility within the genetic material already there. Well, it, if, and again, it, it gets tricky. It gets semantics, again, because evolution can mean a couple of different things. I don't like using the word because I don't want there to be any confusion. I don't believe in overall evolution, meaning that I don't believe a cat's going to go to a horse and from a horse to a cat. I don't believe that. Now, if you say microevolution exists where this horse can look like a horse or look like a zebra, then yes, I do believe in that. I believe genetically it has the characteristics – embedded in those alleles, those variant forms of the genes, to express different outward characteristics. We see that all the time. But that's not moving from one kind to another. And it's because of this type of characteristic that we have what makes the arc um, situation possible. Because this is really where we come under fire. You believe in a book where a boat carried a bunch of animals that have everything we have today. You want me to believe that? Well, you also want me to believe that all living things came from a rock. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to be... That might have been over the line. I don't know. But um, but let's take a look at a few things right before... Oh, we're... I'm going to go anyways. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're right there at the end of time, I know. But I just wanted to introduce a few more things to you. Uh, so the arc, okay... Is it plausible that all the animals that were needed to have all the animals we have today could have been on the ark? Well, turns out, yes. Uh, so some a few dimensions of the ark that we actually get in the Bible. It is three cu 300 cubits uh, long, 50 cubits wide, or 30 and 30, 30 cubits high, which is approximately 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. What's interesting about the ratios... Uh, here on the ark is that it is the best ratios for a large ship to uh, have long voyages in rough seas. Uh, actually, in modern times, I think World War I ships actually used roughly these um, dimensions for ships. What's interesting, how in the world would somebody in that day and age know those ratios? They wouldn't. That's really kind of uh, a scientific foreknowledge within the Bible in of itself. But the dimensions of the ark, even if it didn't happen, why would the ratios be perfect for the boat back in that day? How would they know that? Be a lucky guess? Eh, I don't think so. Now, the ark capacity. It had approximately 1.5 million cubic feet of capacity. Uh, that's a capacity enough to hold 570 railway cars. If the average size of each animal on the ark was a sheep, it could hold 120,000 sheep. Now, not everything was the size of a sheep, but you had a lot of stuff that was much smaller than a sheep. Because of the ability to express different genes and express different outward characteristics, especially when you have an environment that lets all this flourish, you're going to have maybe just one ancestor. All the dogs that we see now have come from a wolf, come from breeding. Same kind of thing occurred grouping-wise, kind-wise from the ark. It is not only plausible, seems very realistic that that actually occurred. And again, I wanted to bring that up at the end of this uh, to kind of bridge that gap because that's something you'll be met with if you get into a conversation with people about this. You want me to believe all this stuff came from an ark? Well, if you give me the time, I think I can show you why that's pretty good chance that it did happen. So I know we've covered a lot today. Um, next week, we'll kind of get out of the weeds just a little bit, but we are 
wrapping up uh, on this study. Uh, I hope that it's been good for you. I hope that um, it's been beneficial. Uh, if you have any last comments or questions, feel free. Like, no, man, it's lunchtime. I need to get out of here. Uh, uh, thank you guys uh, for being here and listening. Uh, we'll end with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you again for uh, this time that we've been able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to, again, study um, another portion um, of information that you've bestowed upon us that hopefully bolsters our, our faith, helps us defend it well, and hopefully bring others to you. Lord, help us to go out this week uh, rejuvenated uh, and motivated to not only be the Christian example we ought to be, but to be seeking those who are lost. Lord, we know that there are many out there that are struggling with different things. I pray that you be with each and every one of their scenarios and, Ill, um, and ills. I pray, Lord, again, that we be the solution to someone's problem. Help us to be looking for those opportunities. Lord, we're so thankful for not only the material blessings we have, we're so thankful for our families, the people in our lives that mean so much to us. Pray that you bless them. Pray, pray that you keep them safe. Lord, we're most thankful for your son, the amazing sacrifice he gave for us. And Lord, the uh, prospect of a home with you in heaven. We ask this all in your son's most high, holy, and powerful name. Amen.